genres have no gender, really. I mean, if you look at them closely, the, the mysteries revolve around behavior. And in Jane Eyre, the wonder of Jane Eyre is the book is about finding out that I am my own person. When Jane says, I can take care of myself, the book was banned. The book was condemned in pulpits. The book is considered revolutionary art because I can take care of myself. That was the voice of Vincent Virga, the author of Gaywick, which is the first modern male-male gothic romance published by Avon in 1980. This is an amazing conversation. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Every conversation we have had has been so different and so varied. But talking to Vincent, who was really writing a romance kind of outside of both like rom- rom- the romance community, but also outside of the literary community, but deeply rooted in the gay community, makes for a really interesting conversation. He is going to talk about his lifelong relationship with his um, partner, Jimmy. Jimmy. Gonna, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. We love you. We love Jimmy. Um, we've never met Jimmy, but we, we love Vincent but, and Jimmy a lot. Look, I have plans. Yes. <laughs> He's going to talk about the experience of, of writing Gaywick, of living through the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, about life in New York, and learning what it meant to be part of a literary culture that most of America had turned its back on. Also about what's underneath Hillary Clinton's bed. Vincent's stories are, are unbelievable. The people he has known, the people he has met, the stories that he's going to tell. But most of all, his commitment to really making a space for queer, young people to see themselves in a happily ever after. This one's fabulous. You're going to love it. Welcome, everyone, to Faded Mates. I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And I'm Jennifer Prokop, a romance reader and editor. Without further ado, here is our conversation with Vincent Virga. Thank you so much for joining us on Faded Mates. It's been quite an adventure for me. (laughs) Tell us why. Because I (laughs) haven't revisited Gaelic, actually revisited it, since 2000, when it was reprinted uh, in this edition with a hideous cover by Allison Books. Oh, sure. And with that edition, I wrote an afterword explaining how the book happened. And essentially, as I say in that uh, piece, my memory works uh, visually. I All of my information is stored in my memory visually. I'm totally visually literate. So basically, when I think about the beginning of Gaywick, where was I when I started it? I see myself. Literally, I see myself sitting in a house, (laughs) big house on a hill in Shinnecock, which is the first town in the beginning of the Hamptons. Mm -hmm. Long Island splits at Hampton Bays and the east end begins at Shinnecock. And so I'm sitting in this house on a hill. And the question is, how did I get there? And that's where my partner, Jimmy McCourt, comes in. We've been together 56 years. And he basically has flawless recall. (laughs) So our pal, Susan Suntag, wrote in On Photography, she invented this phrase called time's relentless melt. That is the history of me. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Same, yes. same. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> my best friend is my own memory. Like, I'll call her and be like, okay, so how did that happen again? And she remembers, which is very nice. Yes. Well, I also would be great for you because <laughs> I remember how it happened. But you can't ask me, when did that happen? Mm. So essentially, I walk in and I say to Jimmy, when did this happen? I said, I remember I'm sitting in this house and you went down to get the mail. 
and it was high on a hill. So he went down on a bike and then he was coming up on a bike, shouting, shouting at the top of his lungs. I have a letter from Maria Callas. Maria Callas, the opera singer. Yes, (laughs) Maria Callas. And then out he shouted, Maria, (laughs) Maria. Now, Jimmy had published, this is 1975. So Jimmy had published his first book, Mardu Gorgeous, which got stupendous, stupendous reviews. And basically, uh, it was the first book to be published by New York Review Books of a living author. Wow. And I was sitting on the hill in Shinnecock, because I had just been fired by the New York Review of Books. <laughs> I was, I was the only person <laughs> they have ever fired. And they fired me because I had been causing trouble. It, it's a long story, but I had been causing trouble. So they fired me, uh, cl- making some really absurd, absurd claim. However, they paid me unemployment. And so there I was. It was summer. I hate the summer. My whole life after being fired was based on getting out of the city and the heat. In fact, my whole career is freelance. And so I went out. Lenny, let me and a friend of mine, gave us this house. And so there I am, 1975. Jimmy's got his letter from Maria, which was actually a fan letter. She was his fan. Imagine getting a fan letter. She was his fan. Maria Collins. (laughs) He, He adored her, but also. Her colleague was Victoria de Los Angeles, who's one of the great opera singers from that period. Mm -hmm. And she she has the great poem and the great Madame Butterfly recordings. And basically, Jimmy was 10 at the Metropolitan Opera. His mother took him. They'd been going because a friend had a box and they were going Saturday. He was 10. And he was really... (laughs) Not very happy with most of the operas, but suddenly there was the marriage of Figaro. And there was Maria, uh, was Victoria de Los Angeles. And when it was over, Jimmy said to his mother, I want to meet her. So they went backstage and this little guy with these big glasses began to talk to her. And that was the beginning of the most profound friendship. Jimmy and Victoria, and when I joined, and me, we would travel around Europe with her, going to her recitals, going to her performances, being backstage, and it was a truly great adventure. And that is basically how we got to Ireland, but that's later. So here I am (laughs) on the hill. And at this point, you see, I had had access to publishing houses because the first chapter of Jimmy's Mardu was published in 1971 in the New American Review 13. It was the cover story. And we actually came home from London because Jimmy got a telegram from uh, Ted Solitaroff saying, Mardu Gorgeous Dazzling. So we came home and I went with him and we met the team at Simon & Schuster. This is like the good old days of publishing. I know. Get a telegram, Absolutely. fly home to New York to meet That's Simon exactly and Schuster. That's right. <laughs> and we meet, and we meet T- Ted Solitara. Vincent, in my life, I have never received a <laughs> telegram from my publisher, and I object. Actually, Jimmy received that one. And Jane Fonda, when I was working with her on her books, I was a picture editor. She would send me telegrams. We're, it was so civilized. <laughs> it, it was Absolutely top civilized and so thrilling. I mean, there we were zooming home for the New American Review. And then the book was sold by Jimmy's agent, Elaine Markson, to Simon and Schuster. And while I was there, I met the team, as I said, uh, Roma Mustel and Gypsy to Silver. Now, this is important because Simon and Schuster at that point was publishing all of these gothic romances. Mm. And I said to them... Uh, Wait, I'm going to stop. At this point, were you reading these gothic romances or were they just sort of... I loved the form, but I was not reading the the new ones. My gothic romances were Jane Eyre, Frankenstein, (laughs) Frankenstein, absolutely. And also Wilkie Collins, Woman in White. Mm. The secret in Wilkie Collins, I used to say, it's worth killing for. Mm. 
I would kill if that were my secret. <laughs> so that when <laughs> I was completing Gaywick, I kept writing new endings until I had an ending, a secret that I would kill. Oh, that's so there are so basically great. three endings to Gaywick. Okay. Because that it really is the that's the cornerstone of the good gothic is that there is a there is a twist at the end. There's a a real and you don't twist. see it coming. Absolutely. So I began reading them. I, I would send them to my mother. And that once I was out there and I picked up, I think it was Kashal Mara or it was one of them, a mega bestseller. And I'm reading this puppy. And all of a sudden, I discovered that the secret wasn't a crazy wife in the attic. <laughs> the secret was actually, the secret was the husband was a closet faggot. That was the secret. So the wife would swoon, faint, and then she would fall into the arms of her best friend who would say, I never liked that guy. <laughs> and so that's how they ended. And that, that became a form. So that became a secret that you saw over many times. Over, over and, and over, over again. again. Okay. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, this is totally unacceptable. And meanwhile, my mother's reading this. And meanwhile, I'm living with Jimmy. And I'm thinking to myself, this is absolutely hideous. And at that point, I had not come out. Vincent, I want to come back to that. But also, can you give us a sense of time at this point? What year are we in? We're in 1972. When New American Review, 1973. That's when I was born, Vincent. I just want to. <laughs> you know what? Because I'm usually the oldest person on these calls. So I just want to enjoy uh, being like, like, I'm the young one now. I'm the young one. Yes, yes. I just turned 79 and Jimmy just turned 80. So this is the mid-70s and Jen has just been born, which is the most important part of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sweet baby yeah. girl. You, you were saying you had not come out yet. I had not come out, but I would visit my mother and my father and they would say to me, who's watching the cat? <laughs> and I would say, I live with Jimmy. And I kept saying that, that we met in 1964 at Yale Graduate School. And basically, I'm living with Jimmy. And they would look at me and nod. And they never computed. So basically, I thought I have to deal with this at some point. And I'm reading these books and my hair is on fire. I'm thinking, this is disgusting. Sure. So there I am in the house on the hill, and I'm reading Lolita. I'm reading Lolita. And I thought to myself, this could be a boy. Hmm. And then the next thought was, if Shakespeare had a sister, why can't Jane Eyre have a brother, hmm. John? And that was the point when I thought, genres have no gender, really. Yeah. I mean, if you look at them closely, the, the mysteries revolve around behavior. And in Jane Eyre, the wonder of Jane Eyre is the book is about finding out that I am my own person. Mm -hmm. When Jane says, I can take care of myself. The book was banned. The book was condemned in pulpits. The book is considered revolutionary art because I can take care of myself. So basically, that became the basis of this. And also, the other basis was Rochester has to go blind in order to see the truth. I began to think about my boy, my narrator. And it all sort of came together pretty fast, too fast, mm. because I settled in and I, thought, I, I began to write very quickly. Now, I don't know how to write a novel. I never knew how to write a novel. Mm. But I knew what novels were. I had been reading them since I was very, very young. I started reading when I was five. And basically, I started reading the stories. And then in grammar school, I was reading 
novels. I was reading Dickens. And so when I got, I remember in the, in the 10th grade, Miss Marsh, who was a genius of a teacher, she assigned Jane Eyre. And then she assigned Vanity Fair, which I adored. But while other kids in my class were bored, I went on for, to read all of Bronte. Mm -hmm. And I went on to read all of Thackeray. Mm -hmm. And so when I later discovered Wilkie Collins, I read all of Wilkie Collins. And essentially, that's a lot of books. And the same with Dickens. And so when I realized that uh, I wanted to write a book, I said to Jimmy, I think I want to write a book. And Jimmy said to me, what took you so long? Yeah. <laughs> what a good dude. <laughs> what, what took you so long? And also, we had a joke. Virginia Woolf said, you shouldn't start writing until you're 33. Hmm. I was 33. Ah, See? And uh, it was perfect. I mean, the gods were all ordaining this. Did you read, like, pulp? Like, was there, like, fiction that featured gay characters at all? Or were you really steeped in these classics? I was steeped in the classics. And when, and remember now, we're talking 1970. And so I was pretty much reading the classics. And also, I, I never had been to a gay bar. Mm. I mean, I met Jimmy and, and New Haven. And uh, I never went to a gay bar. And so basically... I was reading the classics. And in fact, I wanted to become an academic. And Jimmy wanted to become an academic. Actually, he was in a PhD program at NYU, which he thought was, this, this is the end of my life. This is so boring. <laughs> and so he announced that he was leaving NYU, that he was going to Yale Graduate School of Drama to find a husband. That's what he told <laughs> all of his friends. That was the reason he went to Yale. And so- And it uh, worked. No, I, and look at this. <laughs> it did work. And he also brought, in the beginning of the term, all of his gay friends from Manhattan. So basically, it was a total revelation to me. These queens were swanning around and they were laughing. They were all opera mavens and they, they would sit down at the piano and make up operas. And it was a whole other realm for me. And so, uh, no, I, I don't think that I, I didn't read pulps. I mean, I read Dragonwick. I also must tell you, my mother, when she was young, she worked in publishing in Macmillan. So the house on Long uh, the house in Manhattan, and then the house on, the apartment in Manhattan and the house on Long Island was floor to ceiling books. Mm -hmm. And they were all bestsellers. So they were things like, you know, of King's Row, which in fact, I've just reread. I'm, I love those mega bestsellers. That's the thing, right? Those mega bestsellers feel that there's a reason why they are bestsellers. They appeal Absolutely. to a really Absolutely. intense sense of storytelling that we all have. Absolutely. So there I am, you know, reading uh, Thackeray. And, and when I was in college, they, uh, my, t my professor assigned Clarissa. Sure. Clarissa. And so I went to the bookstore and there was this tiny paperback called Clarissa. And also it had in big letters on the back, abridged. And I remember <laughs> thinking, I don't think so. <laughs> so I went to the library and I said to the librarian who knew me at that point, And I said to the librarian, I have to read Clarissa. I want to read the whole thing. Do you have the whole thing? <laughs> and he went into the back and he came back carrying these three tomes. Giant book. <laughs> the three volumes of Clarissa. And he said to me, no one has checked this book out. No one has ever for read. over a hundred years, he said. <laughs> this book has been here for a hundred years and no one has ever read the whole thing. So that basically tells you, you know, what I was like with my reading. And I think that's why I said in the beginning, I don't know how to write novels. Mm but I know what they are so that the when I read them hardwired, hardwired, not only with Clarissa, but also with King's Row, mm -hmm. you know, and th the whole idea of telling a story. And also I grew up in the movies, essentially. I mean, I was, I think I was four when I was taken to the Wizard of Oz. Um, and so the movies, I became obsessed with the movies and I grew up 
literally in the movies. Sure. Um, the narrative, visual narrative, and of course, now when I look back, I realize that it was it was helping me develop my visual sensibility. Sure. And as as gay with the first draft, I put it aside, and I'm thinking, I I have to let this sit. And so I started a, a novel called The Comfortable Corner. And I started writing A Comfortable Corner. And I actually, over the next, I think, two years, completed the first draft of that. And then I went back to Gaywick. And I did the second and third draft of Gaywick. But I must tell you, from the beginning, I knew that it was a game. I knew. Mm. I knew that I was going to take lines from the great novels. And the great movies. Am I wrong in thinking that it begins with this echo of Rebecca? Like, last night I dreamed I was at Manderley again. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So the game begins. And, and I, throughout the book, at one point when he has all of these, he gets all of these clothes from Donna, when he picks up all these shirts and he says, I've never seen so many beautiful shirts. <laughs> that's probably the most famous one. Um, that's also a key. It gives things away. And at one point he says, no one's ever called me darling before. And that's Betty Davis and now Voyagers. So there are dozens this. of them. I mean, them. and that's yeah. why it's so appealing because when you think about the great romance novels, there is something that echoes that echoes media and pop culture and Absolutely. and and culture writ large and Absolutely. that's why we love we did a whole episode on on retellings of faded mates and oh. there's such an appeal to retellings because we know the story and also we like the game as you as you call it yes it's the game and i think when book came out and was reviewed by Armistead Mopan he said he, he goes on and on with, with such delight. The tone is perfect. And the last line is, I wonder if Robert and Dano saw Judy at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> perfect. Oh, did you frame it on your wall? And then he says, read the son of a bitch. Yeah. You'll love it. Uh, and that became the key word. And when I was rereading it now, I thought, I thought of Armistead and I thought to myself, yeah. I get it. I really like this book. Yeah, it's really <laughs> fun. I really like this yeah. book. And I read the Son of a Bitch mm -hmm. and I loved Good. it. Good. <laughs> so essentially, I'm here today with this, with this sense of uh, celebration. I love and it's delightful to me that I'm now getting all of these, I'm getting all these fan emails from people of all ages again. And there's a question you ask. And I, I want to tell you, first of all, I had no community, hmm. none. And that is a thing that we talk about. It's a question that we ask all the time. Who was your community? So I had no community as a writer, none. Also, Jimmy's success, you know, he was published by Knopf. The book's got fabulous reviews. And it brought me into a very high voltage literary community mm -hmm. in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I, when Gaywick was published, I didn't really care. I did my job and it got wonderful reviews and people were reading it. But that community, that community, it became their dirty secret. Mm -hmm. Very familiar. <laughs> so I would go to these events and John Ashbury would come up to me and tell me, I love your book. And I remember Tim Douglas calling me over and saying, <laughs> I love your book. <gasps> it yeah. really shocks me how much I love your book. Oh, that's my favorite. It shocks me. I couldn't believe it was it good. All, <laughs> oh, no, I couldn't believe it. And it was this game. And there I was. And I remember being at a party at James Merrill's house and his saying, my nephew says Gaywick saved his life. Mm. He was in the most profound despair, and he read Gay. So before we go much further down this, people reading the book, can we talk a little bit about how the book came to be? Yes. It's written. You've edited it. Where does it go from there? No, no. No? No, no. I wrote it, and Jimmy's editor, Elaine Markson, read it and loved it. <laughs> and she said to me, I will sell this book. This is unique. It's actually beautifully written. 
And I love this book. So she sent it around. She sent it to Kanaf. She sent it to all her friends. And it was rejected. Boing, 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 boing. She gathered 35 rejections. At this point, I had this huge career in publishing as a picture person. Eventually, I, I, I'm the only person who ever researched, edited, designed, and captured picture sections. I, the last couple of books I did were by the Clintons. I did Hillary's book, Bill's book. I've got an eight-page resume, 163 books, yeah. right? So this is also going on. And my mentor is Michael Corder, and who is the head of publishing at Simon & Schuster. And Elaine sent it to everybody. Everybody. And were the rejections because it was happily ever after? Was it because it was gothic? Was it because it was gay? I, I think was it the... was gay and no one could cope with it. They couldn't figure out what was I doing defiling this, uh, this sure. fabulous genre that was making <laughs> fortunes for them. And meanwhile, I'm taking the villain and making him the hero. I love it. So essentially. <laughs> what are you, Milton? They, oh, right, exactly. <laughs> and they could not cope. So. Simon and Schuster. I worked with all of them. And one of the great divas was named Alice, um, Alice Mayhew. She, she did the Woodward Bernstein books. I mean, she was the great diva of the political book. I did many, many books with her. Her assistant was a woman named Gwen Edelman. Okay. When Gwen left Alice, she went to Avon Books. So at this point, Avon Books is not a part of HarperCollins. It's a pulp publisher. Absolutely. And they do mass market reprints and pulp fiction. Absolutely. And just for the last few years have been doing paperback originals like yes. Rosemary Rogers and Kathleen Widowis. Yes. And those kind of big romance names. Yes. All the, the romances. So I sent it to Etcha Gwen and she called me and she said, I love this book, <laughs> but I can't publish this book. And I remember Gwen was a friend. When we were in East Hampton, where we went every summer to get away from the heat. And it was also East Hampton, B.C. <laughs> <laughs> East Hampton before computer. No helicopters flying back and no forth. No, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and Gwen's daddy owned what we, in, in the romance novel realm would call an estate <laughs> so essentially <laughs> and uh, she, he, we were on different sides of the highway he was south of the highway i was north of the highway but my neighbor east egg and wet west egg uh, yeah right, right. <laughs> and my neighbor was gwen was a uh, gwen verdon whom i worshiped I mean, the first musical I ever saw as a kid sure. was Redhead. Sure. She and Bob Fosse. And she was my neighbor. So basically, it was that, that was East Hampton, you know? So Gwen came to see me and she sat down and she said to me, I have to tell you, I really love this book and I'm so sorry I can't publish it. And I said, why can't you publish it? And Gwen said to me, gay people don't want romance. Hmm. Why wouldn't you know that? Vincent. <laughs> gay people don't buy romance. And obviously, I wouldn't know that because I wrote this book called Gaywick. And had I known that, I wouldn't have written that book. And it was also one of the reasons it had been rejected by everybody. Gay people don't want romance. What nonsense. I said to Gwen, Gwenny, you've <laughs> known me and Jimmy for years, years. You know, you know our lives. You've been with us at parties. You've been with us at dinner. You know. You know our lives, Gwen. In fact, you even know I came out in Paris. Mm. What is more romantic We're better. Than Nothing. than coming out in Paris? <laughs> Nothing. So she said to me, I, I live over a, a, a leather bar in, in the West Village. And she said to me, I know gay people don't want romance. Because of the leather bar in the, re in the West Village? The leather bar, because oh, she was in the West Village and all she that's saw- That's the was, source she's citing. She only saw cruising. She only saw New York City in that period of time, pre-AIDS, and she only saw that. That's, that's all that she knew about the gay community. So basically, I said, Gwen, look at Jimmy and me, as I said. And she said, right. So she went back and she- presented the book to Bob Wyatt, who was gay. Huh. Okay. He 
was the, <laughs> he, he was the publisher. And so he loved it. And so they said, yes, they loved it. They loved it. The only caveat they had was I had to change the title. Last week, we released our Best of the Year episode, where Jen and I chose 10 of our favorite romance novels from 2021, the books that really kept us going over a particularly challenging year. If you haven't listened to that episode, you should head back there and listen to it after this one. But if you have, you know that this year we are working again with Old Town Books, a fabulous independent bookseller in Alexandria, Virginia. And the people at Old Town are putting together a killer book box that includes print copies of eight of the ten choices on our list. You can head directly to Old Town Books using the link in show notes to access the book box and place an order for yourself, for a friend, for a number of friends, um, support local businesses, great independent booksellers, and fabulous authors writing really terrific and wonderful books this year. We are so excited, as always, to include Fade and Made stickers in this box. Old Town is throwing in some goodies into these boxes, and we think that they make not only great holiday gifts for you and your friends, but also just in general, a really great memory. One of the few, maybe, great memories of 2021. Again, check show notes for links. Thank you to Old Town Books for always jumping up and being willing to join us in our wild ideas. And thank you to every single one of the fabulous authors who wrote one of the great books on the 2021 list. So the original title was Gaywick? Or- Gaywick. Gaywick. They said, you have to change the title. And I said, but it's a game, you know, Dragon Wick. It's a game. This is all part of the game. No, 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 no. We want something more in the romantic uh, line. Sure. So I started. I started making these lists of romantic titles. And I don't. when our papers went to Yale, to the Beinecke Library, I scooped up everything that had to do with Gaywick, all the different drafts, everything. And that list is there. Oh, wow. I wish to get it back. <laughs> I wish I could remember what they Attention were. Attention, Yale University. <laughs> I, when, when I was reading, someone two summers ago, someone got a scholarship to go work with Jimmy's um, papers at Yale for his PhD, and he also went through my diaries because they're all there, and everything is there. Jimmy's still shocked by everything. It was the perfect way to clean out a New York City apartment, <laughs> and my sister's You're like, Yale. Do you like my things? <laughs> Do you Everything want my paper? Went to <laughs> Every single thing. And so I tried and I tried. Meanwhile, thinking, oh, I can't bear changing the title of this book. I just can't bear it. And so then they created the cover. Which and is, of course, so, the yes. cover. It's stunning. It's flawless. It's stunning. Stunning. The first time I ever saw it, I gasped out loud. And then I called my yeah, editor, Avon, and I was like, how do I get a copy of this? The answer was, you can't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Nice no, it's, intri- it's intriguing, 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 because people, when they got out into the bookstores, it was mistaken for a straight romantic novel. Oh, because it looks, I mean, it looks just yeah. like all the other gothics, which is how it should look. Absolutely. That's how it should look. And at first Hill, glance, absolutely. Rooting men. <laughs> absolutely. On the, Crashing with the, waves. Right. It was perfect. I loved it. And so out it went into the world. And then bookstores starting put started to put warnings on it, oh. saying, "You need to know this is a, a gay, a gay gothic, hmm. a, a gay romance." And I, one of my pic- clients, my picture editing clients at that point was John Ehrlichman from the Watergate years, and. I loved him. And I would come home and say th- things to Jimmy like, oh, God, John Ehrlichman is a sweetie. And Jimmy would say, get a grip. And so basically. John Ehrlichman I, about to go to jail. For- <laughs> well, actually, yes. And what happened was when I read his manuscript, he went to jail. And when I read his manuscript, I said, John, you tell me everything, but you don't tell me why you went to jail. And so he wrote a chapter why I went to jail. Mm-hmm. So he and I became really good friends. And he read Gaywick. 
and he loved it. And when he went out on the road, he would call me and he would say, I'm in Oklahoma, I'm in Mississippi, I'm in bookstores selling my book. And I'm, I'm asking them why they don't have Gaywick. And many of them do have Gaywick. Oh, wow. And then he went to Texas and he called me and I said, I was just in a bookstore in Texas. And that that bookstore has a bullet hole in the window, which was put into Gaywick. <gasps> Wow. We mustn't forget this. Yeah. We mustn't forget this. The night of my party, my Gaywick party in 1980, November, was the night of the Ramrod massacre. And I know it happened because we were at my party at Lane's West Village apartment and we heard gunshots. Wow. And then we heard police. So we must not ever forget this. And then I went out uh, on my tour, and I was, I was invited to meet the editor. He was Brent Harris. He loved the book. I went to see him, but before I got in the house, I got a phone call to- telling me he was very sick. He was dying. And he was, in fact, I would be the last person he would be seeing before he went into this hospice. And when I got there, he, he loved the book and he loved Mardu. And so we were talking about that. He loved Kalas, he loved Victoria. And we got all engaged with all of this stuff. So my short visit became ours. And while we were talking, his friends were packing up his apartment mm. because he was being moved out. And he was one of the first, he said, I know of five of us. They're calling it the gay cancer. They don't know what it is yet. But there's this thing happening. We mustn't forget that either. Because I... This is difficult. One of my best friends is Colm Tobin. I've read... All of his books, I met him when we were both young in Dublin. And he he wrote a book called The Story of the Night, which I never read because it was about AIDS. When Gateway came out, and then two years later, it was followed by A Comfortable Corner, which is a book about recovery from alcoholism, written from the point of view of the, the other, used to be called The Codependent. And basically, those books were picked up all over the place. They were picked up by the 12-step groups. They were picked up by the gay men all over the place. And then then I started getting invited to the hospital. And Jimmy was invited to the hospital. He could go. I could go. But I would faint. Mm. Literally, I would faint. And I was in analysis at that point. I had given myself analysis for my 40th birthday. And Jimmy always said to me, oh, you'll just love this. You get to talk all about yourself ever. <laughs> and so my analyst said to me when I said, I'm, I'm fainting, he said to me, you're having the correct response. So I realized this was a problem. And um, I couldn't go to wakes either. But I was invited because of the books, because the men loved the books. Mm -hmm. And so I went. I did the best that I could. And basically, I couldn't write. The reason there's such a gap between Gaywick and a Comfortable Corner and Vajrio Vale was because I actually suffered from what we now recognize as PTSD. It was, it was PTSDville. That's all I can say. I and uh, lost so many friends. And when years later, when I met, when I met my friend Mark Doty, my, when I met my friend Mark Doty for the first time, he said to me, when my partner was dying. In Provincetown, we would read your books over and over. Gosh, and so then also, when I was doing uh, 
Capote with Gerald Clark, he said to me, Truman reads your book aloud every Christmas. Uh, oh my God. Wow. So there was, there's that going on. And, um, and you're also, you're getting telephone calls in the middle of the night. I am getting, yes, telephone calls. And the most stunning, remember now, this uh, the year, so I was still in the phone book. Sure. And I would get, I would get telephone phone calls. Bugs. And one, one, <laughs> imagine, phone. I actually had someone come to my apartment with this kid and I still have a black hanging phone because I love it as a souvenir. And the kid said to me, what's, what's that? that? Oh yeah. I yeah. teach middle schoolers and like we, a kid was like, how did, and another kid was like, you put your finger in and you. <laughs> yes. 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 So the phone rang in the middle of the night and it's this young boy calling me from the Midwest because he had read Gaywick and he had been going to kill himself. He was going to shoot himself. And he was in love with his gym teacher. And he said to me, I found Gaywick. I found it in the A&P because of that cover, because it had been stacked in all of these places. So he found it. And he said to me, is it true that men can be together? And I said, I'm together with, I'm together with Jimmy. We've been together since 1964. And we're very together. I mean, we have a completely together relationship. Um, and it's also exclusive. We never opened it. It's been exclusive for 56 years for me. And so I said, of course, yes, it is. And then I said to him, if ever you need to talk about this, if ever you get frightened, call me. And he said to me, I won't have to call you. I just have to reread Gaywick. <laughs> I. Oh my God. Were, I'm a mess. I know. I'm, like, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm a mess. <laughs> and so then AIDS hits and I am paralyzed. And I mean paralyzed. I mean, I was uh, paralyzed. So what happened then was my career just became huge. Huge. I, I, I was, I became literally America's foremost picture editor. Right. Michael Corder christened me the Michelangelo of picture editors. So I was all over the place. And Jimmy's editor at Farrow Star said, Oh dear, hair by Kenneth, pictures by Vincent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm going to these posh events. And all of these people are coming up to me and saying, I love your book. Mm -hmm. I love your book. They'll never talk about it. And I said, you know, I would say to Jimmy, I don't give a shit. I did what I did. I achieved what I did. I'm proud of the book. I don't care if they like it or not. And Jimmy said, that makes it more difficult for them. Really makes it more difficult for them. So I would go to all the parties and inevitably one of them, some Mega star would come up to me and say, I love your book. <laughs> um, and that became a joke that Jimmy and I had. You kept a list on the fridge. Just yeah, right. <laughs> love your book. I can't tell you. And then my mother and father were sitting having lunch and they are listening to the radio and they begin fiddling on the dial. And all of a sudden, they discover NPR. With bells ringing and bats screeching and scary music. And the announcer says, our guest today is Vincent Birger, the author of the first gay gothic. And so at this point, to be clear, <laughs> you have not come out to your parents? No. And no. your parents don't know that you've written a book? No. <laughs> but you did write it under your actual name. My, in fact, I wrote it under my actual name. This is amazing. <laughs> and my youngest brother, who was today a devoted Trumpster, said to my oldest sister, I have to change my name. He said, I have to change sure. my name. Okay. How can I go to school with this? And meanwhile, my sister is giving it to all, all of her friends. And my middle brother was a deacon of a church upstate New York. Who, the, 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 they, had, they spoke out against homosexuality. So when Gaywick was published, my brother bought 
the number of copies that he needed and gave one as a Christmas present to each deacon <laughs> and resigned from the church. So there's my brother oh, love that and my other brother too. saying, I have to change my name. Um, so, <laughs> so your parents stumble upon NPR. Outed by NPR, it seems like a very niche way to like, come out. <laughs> You know, and, and my parents also, they never listened to NPR. They were probably looking for some talk show, you know, some dish show that they could have over over lunch. So I went out the next weekend. So they said nothing or did they summon you? No, no, they said nothing, nothing, nothing. And um, I didn't even know they'd heard it. I, I Nothing. So we go to Abraham and Strauss, which is a huge supermarket. Um, department store in a mall where I had worked as a kid. That's where I worked as a kid for all of those years between uh, college and between Yale. In fact, the year between Yale, I was actually reviving trout because they had built this huge trout field. You paid $5 and you went shipping, but the trout were coming up in the heat. So my job was wearing hip boots and reviving trout. So we went to... <laughs> <laughs> we went to A&S and uh, we're going up the escalator and there is a banner over the bookstore that says, gay, Vincent Berger. And I say, oh my God, look at that. And my parents ignored it. Like it didn't exist. Didn't exist. Didn't exist. <sighs> I finally, at one point soon after that, they said to me something like, who's minding the cat? And I said, Jimmy, I live with Jimmy. I've been living with Jimmy. And basically, I, I wrote a book called Gaywick. And that's when they admitted hearing it on NPR. That's when they talked about the banner. My mother read it. And she said to me, I thought there was too much sex. <laughs> My mother said the same thing. <laughs> I said, how could you tell? It's written in all, it's written in all of that prose, that Victoria sure, prose. Right. It's buried in the prose. I said, how could you tell? And then he said, ah, but you've been reading those books I'm sending you. <laughs> you've been reading those romances. And then basically uh, I, I, I went to sleep. Hmm. So now is this happening because Avon is just behind this book? Avon was behind it, but actually, the world was behind it. That's great. Armistead said Moped was behind it. It was time. It was time. And so Richard Howard, who was a great poet and translator, he tells me the story that he was driving across the United States with, with his partner, and they were listening to NPR. And all of a sudden, this thing appeared, the bells chiming, <laughs> and there I am. And the two of them started screaming at the top <laughs> of their voice with joy. Years later, I picked up, I'm still constantly reading, right? And I picked up Madame de Lafayette's Princesse de Clèves, which is considered the first French psychological novel. It's about a woman an aristocratic woman who marries an aristocratic man and then falls, she falls in love with another man. She falls in love with this man and in Roman Catholic fashion, she has a nervous breakdown, <laughs> she's hysterical and basically uh, at the end of the book, she goes into a convent and dies. <laughs> so I thought to sure. myself, <laughs> you know what? Why couldn't a man fall in love with a woman and marry her and then fall in love with an aristocratic man. Why can't, since I took the genre form, why can't I take the psychological novel? Mm. And so I flipped it around, of course. We meet Vagio Vale in a monastery, which he leaves for various reasons to go out into the world to actually discover himself. And he discovers himself, he marries this wonderful woman, and he falls in love with Armand de Guise. Now, the names, Armand de Guise, is actually a name that's in the Princess de Clef. Mm -hmm. And I plot that book along the lines of the Princess de Clef, but I hook it into Robert and Dano Gaylord. I make Robert and Dano Armand's best friend. Ah, oh, it's 
perfect. Series. A series is born. And they also live across from each other in Gramercy Park. And when I wrote Gaywick, the first draft, I was the superintendent of a building on Gramercy Park, a little building. I was the super under a fake name. <laughs> because it was a rent stabilized apartment and I, Jimmy and I needed a place to live. And we were walking down the street. We bumped into our pal from Yale, Bob Landord. And he said to me, I'm getting married and I have this tiny studio apartment on Irving Place. Do you know anybody who wants it? Yeah. And I said, yeah, we want it. And he said, but you have to be Bob Landord. And I said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> this is the most New York thing I've ever yes. I mean, everybody does Then the this. landlord came because he needed a new super. And I answered the door as Bob Lando. And Jimmy was in the bathtub. So in comes the super <laughs> and he sits down and he says to me, will you be the super of the building? And I said, I, I, I can't do anything. And he said, no, no, no. All you have to do is wash down the halls, sort the trash. And when anything goes wrong, you just call somebody. So we talked and talked and talked. And then he got up and he said, okay, it's a deal. Free rent. I said, no, 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 no free rent. I'm thinking free rent. He's going to find out. I'm, and you're not, you know, not Bob Landau. I'm not Bob Lando, <laughs> And I'm out the window. So basically I said, no, no, no. So he said, I have to go to the bathroom. So we went into the bathroom <laughs> and there is Jimmy in the bathtub <laughs> and the landlord pees and then he leaves and Jimmy is freezing in the bathroom. But I said to him, look, just think here we are with, with a frozen <laughs> rent. And I'm now I'm now the super. So basically, it's on it, it, it's, it's on Irving Place <laughs> and on the corner of Irving Place and Gramercy Park. Which is like one of the most beautiful places in the yes. city. For those of you who are not New Yorkers, it's gorgeous, that block. Gorgeous. Yeah. And that's where Robert, that's where Robert and Donna live <laughs> on the corner. Perfect. And across the park, I then moved to 22nd Street in Lexington, around the corner from Gramercy Park. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Armand and Virgil live on the other corner. So for me, they are, that's where they live. And that's where they'll always live. So what, what year was this? I mean, clearly you were still doing picture editing and still had that whole like outlet for your creativity, but writing novels was a little different, right? Yes, and I only wrote in the summers. Yeah, okay. Because I discovered that I couldn't do I couldn't do both. I could research in the winter. I could do some rewriting in the winter. But I was doing these mega best selling books, and I mean, I was working with these. You know, I was working with the president of the United States, and I was working with Jane Fonda, whom I love, and all of these wonderful people on these mega books. And that took a lot of time. Yeah. And also, if I'm doing your book, I read your manuscript. I then make a list of everything I want to see. And then I meet with you. Mm -hmm. And I go through your sock drawer. <laughs> and we wander through what's under your bed. Shelley Winters had these incredible pictures under her bed. And so... That's what I do. And I enter your life with Hillary and Bill Clinton. I entered their lives and I move into the house. And uh, it's hard to write fiction when you've got this Michigas going on. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> and so I would write in the summer. So always the summer. Amazing. For decades, it was East Hampton until East Hampton became too expensive. Then it was one summer in, in Woodstock, which I hated, all these rich people pretending to be poor. And there were also too many mosquitoes. And so, as the gods would have it, Victoria was giving a performance in Dublin, and Jimmy traveled all over the British Isles with her. And then they went to Dublin, and the woman who was in, in control of this whole uh, creative project fell in love with Jimmy and said, you should come and spend summers in Ireland. So that's how we got to Ireland. We spent four years in Dublin. That's where I met Colm Tobin. And then we went out to the west of Ireland, County Mayo. And I actually created a museum out there, co-founded a museum in the west coast of Ireland, in Ballyna. And then I would have, we would come back to New York. And then I got a call from the Library of Congress asking me, my very first book, my very first book was for John Wayne. And it was 12 songs. Michael gave me 12 songs and said, you have to make a book out of this. You've been a pic you, you're a picture editor, right? And I lied. And I said, sure. <laughs> Thinking, how hard could it be? So one of the tenants in my building was Agnes Maya, who was in charge of all the picture research at Salmon and Schuster at Random House. And I said, Agnes, she said, you can't do that. I couldn't do that. <laughs> 
So she gave me a copy of Picture Sources. And I kept p- playing the songs over and over again and thinking to myself, oh, my God, this is such a, a hoot. It's such America. It's all about America. So I called the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, and, I, and the Air Force. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm working on a project with John Wayne. Can I come and go to your files? And they said, John Wayne, sure. <laughs> For him, anything. <laughs> anything. And also, and this is my first book, so I don't even know you're supposed to pay people. And then I thought to myself, all those pretty pictures of America, all of those advertisements for Oldsmobile and Ford. And so I started calling the mega companies and saying, listen, I, I, all those beautiful pictures of America. And they said, we don't, no one can have them. Mm. And I said, well, I'm doing a book for John Wayne. (laughs) Oh, John Wayne. I will give you a credit. I'll give you a credit in a book by John Wayne called America, Why I Love Her. And then I thought, I need more. So I thought to myself, you know, all those Farm Security Administration pictures, Dorothy Lang, all those people I love, they're very America. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Library of Congress and the curator I met became the head curator 15 years later, a prints and photographs. Mm-hmm. And so they called me and said, we, we need to do a book. We're having a major anniversary, 100 years. All of the curators have been working in their different divisions. We need a book. What do you think we should do? And I said, we need to do a book about a history. And I called it Eyes of the Nation, because that's what the Library of Congress is. And also the Library of Congress is America's memory. So I said, Let's do this. And I did that. I said to Jimmy, we're only going to go for, for Eyes of the Nation. He didn't want to come here. He hated it. <laughs> From the very beginning, he said to me, you walk past people, you don't want to fly over there. <laughs> and so we came, and then I did a book called Carnographia, right. which took seven years. I have a copy of it. It's beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? Cartographia is really your your book. You're the author of record. I wrote that book. Meanwhile, remember, I had already done Eyes of the Nation and I had done all these other books. So everybody knew me. I had full access. And when I would go in, I always had a, an idea of what I wanted. And I divided the book. This is what we call in the theater at two o'clock in the morning idea. <laughs> You're supposed to wake up in the morning and say, what a stupid idea. I didn't. I went in and I said to Ron Grimm, who was one of the key mockers at the Library of Congress, and he adored me because he was my guy in Eyes of the Nation. And so I said, I have this idea. And so we began. Mm -hmm. And since I was going all over the world, the book is about maps as cultural documents. I tell the story, the history of the country and the civilization through the map. So I say in the very beginning, it took me forever. And I was under contract to Little Brown. And I went to this big, big event, uh, a publishing event. And Jimmy was hosting a table. And there I was in my tux, surrounded by all of my friends who were editors and chiefs and all these wonderful kids, people who had grown up with me. And the the editor in chief of Little Brown came over and said to me, Vincent, we were talking about you at an editorial board meeting. And I said, oh. And he said, yes. If you don't finish this book in six months, we're canceling the book. (gasps) Not fun. Not cool at a gala. (laughs) No, not cool. I object. And so I I had been all over the Library of Congress for six years. And and all these people explaining what the map meant. And and I I then went back to the library and I thought, I have six months. And I have have thousands of pages. And so I wrote the introduction. What is a map? I wrote the basic introduction. And then as I went through, I thought to myself, you have one day for each map. If you can have one day for each map, we'll then come to the end of it. (laughs) And meanwhile, I was surrounded by all these scholars who kept wanting to read my stuff and they just adored my stuff. And they would say, oh, but you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to explain to me, why did it, why was this huge thing going on in India? And I would say, no. (laughs) I have one day. (laughs) One day. And so I, I did it. I did it. And essentially 
It's a wonderful book. Yeah. I think. And also I invented this thing where I said, I create a metaphor map as a map as B. And when the book came out now, remember I have no, no, I'm not an academic. And when the book came out, it was accepted because of Ron Grimm. And, but I was the key name on the, on the thing and they behaved abominably. Then it went to be reviewed by the great journal, Imago Mundi. And it was assigned to the head of the maps division in the British Museum. Oh, oh. wow. No he, pressure. <laughs> he reviewed the book and he begins with, you know, when I first started reading this book, I thought to myself, it's very relaxed. <laughs> Unlike the British Museum. <laughs> All of a sudden, these metaphors begin. It's beautifully written, but he creates these metaphors for each map. And my first reaction, it's awfully simplistic and it's awfully American. Mm. He writes oh, this. Yeah. Terrible, scathing review. <laughs> then he turns around and says, this book is magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. It is a total triumph. It is so inventive. It is so brilliant. And it's magnificent. Well, that, of course, did not help me in the academic world. <laughs> Amago Mundi, I started reviewing for Amago Mundi, and the, the academics were freaked because I was going to all these conventions and asking all these questions. And um, it was a great, great experience. And then it became number one on Amazon in five different wow. sections. Great. So, and then I stayed on. You know, Jimmy said, oh, you can go home now. But then the, <laughs> then the books kept coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. kept coming. So ultimately, I think there are now 29 books from the Library of Congress with my name. And also I did movie calendars uh, because I had all these friends and, you know, and I would call these people and, and, and the, public, the publisher would say to me, the Library of Congress is a thousand pound gorilla. Mm-hmm. So I very boldly, you know, I would call people. And uh, I, first of all, I called my pal who was the head of 20th Century Fox Legal, and he gave me permission to use the images without paying. Mm. But I had to get permission from everyone in the image. So that meant I had, a, Whoa, that's rough. I had to bring in people. Yeah. We had all those people. I couldn't do it. I mean, basically, two brilliant, brilliant people did that for me. But I had to call the difficult ones. Right. I had to call Lauren Bacall because <laughs> her agency screamed at me over the phone, four letter words. <laughs> so I called her as the, you know, the uh, thousand pound gorilla. And I explained that we wanted to do this for Humphrey Bogart because he wanted to use a picture. And it was Film Preservation Society, which I know she loves. And so she said, oh, sure, you can do it. So she called the people back and said, yeah, he can have this. He can do this. They called me back and every four letter word. <laughs> you know how she treats us? <laughs> You know what she does to us? And then was Kim Novak, which was the joy of my life because I worship Kim Novak. And basically, I put her on the back of Eyes of the Nation. So her people said, no, I call Kim Novak. And Faye Dunaway, I mm-hmm. called Faye Dunaway. And Jimmy had just reviewed her book in the New York Times, which she loved. And I said, basically, when, when are you going to play a Long Day's Journey and Tonight? We, she said, yes. <laughs> so essentially... Amazing. That was what I was doing at the Library of Congress. Amazing. Then comes the process to Clev. Mm. And then comes, then comes Vajio Vale. And then I was thinking again. And I was alive again to my book. And I started thinking, what, what's next? I want the Gaywick trilogy. So what's next? Next is to take the 19th century melodrama. I've taken the Gothic romance. I've taken the psychological drama. Let's do the melodrama. Mm. So basically, I created Children of Paradise. And I will never forget the moment sitting in the west coast of Ireland and starting that book and standing in the front room with Robbie in his house in Gramercy Park. Mm -hmm. And there I was, back with my crowd. Yeah. And then I took uh, the characters from Morris. Because at the end of it, Foster says, they go off into the green sword. And then he says in the, in the final, in his afterward, they could not have lasted in the green sword. 
So I bring them, I bring them to Gay Wicca. Mm-hmm. The whole point when I look back on it is about queer spaces. Now, when I, I'm reading all this stuff and I realize my goal was queer spaces. Gaywick is in 1900, all those people, he's at the opera, all of these people, Vadriel Vale, queer spaces. And so I go epic in Children of Paradise, Mm -hmm. queer spaces. And we invent the movies. Mm -hmm. Robbie becomes a movie director. If I'm going to deal with melodrama, I have to invent the movies. So basically, it cannot be published, I'm told. It exists in the Beinecke Library. And it exists in William and Mary because William and Mary did a celebration of Gaywick. And I, I asked them if they wanted the, the third volume of the trilogy. And basically they said, yes, the reason it can't be published is because it was sent out. And the, re- and the rejections were basically, oh, this book doesn't stand alone. And it's too long ago. Vincent. No one remembers Gaywick. We have to get it published. <laughs> My goal is to have the trilogy published in uniform volumes. That's my goal. And my other goal is either Netflix or Amazon. I want a, I I want a, a, um, a series. Vincent, we're going to get this done. We're going to get that. Well, I can't, I mean, I can't well, get the Netflix no. deal for you, but <laughs> we're going to get this publishing done. We can do this. I, we're going to do this. We're Faded Mates is, is going to come together. We're going to work together we're gonna and we're going to do this. We're going to get this done. I, I, I would really love that. We're going to get it done. It's my dream. Everyone listen up. We're getting it done. Stay tuned. So did you even know it was a romance? I knew it was out there, but I, I, I wasn't interested. I mean, it was heterosexual, and I thought to myself, mm, yeah. I don't want to read these. Yeah. Also, uh, the few I picked up when I was at a- Avon, I thought, <laughs> the, the, I prefer the Lord won't mind. I'm a snob. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I'm a snob. And also, I long, long for romance novels. And I simply, I'm old, and I can't find the, the ones that the genre is problematic for me. In the years since your books were published, have you heard from other gay romance writers who are inspired by you? Do you feel like you've left a mark in that sense, a, a trail? That was all, always very moving mm-hmm. because... Um, at one point, there was a book published, the, a, a Rainbow novel won, won the, the award. I loved it. And, and this is sent my note to this writer. And he, he sent me the most wonderful letters. And I got letters. Letters, we get letters. We get stacks and stacks of letters. When the book was published, I was getting letters from Japan. Mm-hmm. In fact, There was a huge review for the book in Japan, and they sent a film crew over to interview me. Yeah, I I, I got a lot of letters, very moving, very touching. Letters from people who said um, it helped them come out. Mm -hmm. Letters who said they hid the book, and they loved the book so much that they were passing it around. In fact, this week... I got a letter from a man who 20 years ago bought it in a bookstore in Florida. Mm. And then he lent it to someone and never got it back. Mm-hmm. So he wanted it. And he recently tracked it down in the original edition. And he loved it more than ever. And I think last week I got a, a, a older man who are moving and downsizing will write me and say their partners died and they're moving and they're bringing very few books, but they must have mine. They must have mine. So that, that happens as well. I love this book. And then I just get letters randomly saying, this is my favorite novel. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to know that I have no idea what's why I got a letter from a young boy, 24 years old. And he said, I'm a goth, a gay goth, and I love your books. Mm-hmm. I, I said, I'm sure you get letters like this all the time. And I wrote back and I said, 
No. <laughs> I, I do not get letters from 24-year-old gay guys. <laughs> I'm always saying to Jimmy, it's so touching to me. And now to be in that book, you know, the history yes, of the- the romance history from Rebecca Romney. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, I, I think the thing about Gaywick that resonates so much with so many people is that you really did knock down the doors of the gothic which is a genre that many of us love so much. Many of us cut our teeth on those early gothics and you rewrote the, the rules of it. I'm, I'm sad to hear that you, you never had a writer community, but I know for a fact that many writers were inspired by you. Several years ago, there was a convention and, a, and a, there, was a, there was a panel about the gay books. I wasn't invited. Mm. And so I just assumed you know, uh, I've never gone after this. I did it, as I've said, and I just sort of cruised along with it, amused and knowing what I did. But at the same time, I remember a book that came out about gay fiction. And there was a little footnote that said, oh, and then there's gay wick, which is really a footnote and it will never be anything but a footnote. That's mm-hmm. what this thing said. And I thought to myself, OK, so maybe there were other before me. And of course, now I've read you know, I have a whole library of the gay novels before me. Well, I do think that it's worth saying that you, I mean, you are the, as far as any of us can tell, you are the first gay gothic romance, the first gay, possibly the first gay historical modern romance with sex in it and everything. Um, (laughs) And a happy ending. I mean, right. So the happy ending, that was, that, that was the thing that I think even shook Gwen a bit. And I had been told, Michael Corder said to me, I want you to write a book. I want you to write a story about, based on the best of everything, because he had published that mega bestseller. He said, I want you to write a best of everything with four men. I want the gay man to die. Mm. And I said, no. Now, when I look back on it, I thought to myself, you know, I could have killed him in Vietnam. He could have died as a great American hero. But at that point in my heart, I wanted to write this gay gothic. And I'd already started it. I'm I'm getting uh, statements from Amazon that people are buying it again. What what caused this resurgence? It's a book that, you know, people have, people are aware of now. There are many, many more of us now who believe that those paperbacks from the 70s should not have disappeared. They should have been honored in a way that, you know, in the same way that other books from the 70s remain honored. So people are starting to think about the modern romance, the, you know, the happily ever after with sex on the page. What does it look like? What are the roots of the genre? Who are the people who built the house? And we believe that you are a person who has built the house. And now, you know, I've been writing. And uh, I wrote a book called He Cooks, I Clean, which is a joke Jimmy and I had. It's a novel. Uh, He Cooks, I Clean. And uh, my novels are now very, very erotic because D.H. Lawrence said, (laughs) you can't possibly create a fully rounded character if you don't have their love life. That was his argument for Lady Chatterley's lover. And basically... I I always agreed. I mean, I pussyfooted <laughs> through uh, Badriel and through uh, the other ones. I'm a little little bolder in uh, Children of Paradise, but it was inappropriate right. for that period and for my tone. So it's sort of hidden, though my mother sort of snipped it out. <laughs> Moms will do Mothers, that. They know. Mom. And, and now, of course, uh, in these new novels of mine, they're very, very passionate and graphic. But, you know, I've, I've sent them to editors and they say, no. But we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be married now. You know what I mean? It's supposed to be all over. But it's not all over. For me, it will always be the ramrod shootings on the publication night. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can ever move beyond that. So that's where I am. And I'm, uh, I'm sad, deeply saddened. I'm waiting to see what's waiting for me. 
because I'm now reading the prophets. I've just started it. And I don't know what's going to happen in that. But I think it's going to be very unhappy. But of course, they're, they're slaves. And I've already ha- started to cry, like on, in the first chapter, by what he describes. But I, I'm, in, I'm in this, you know. I'm in this. And I live in hope. Wow. That was so amazing. <laughs> Sarah, before we talk about about our feelings, uh, I want you to tell our listeners about the story of how Vincent came to be on the podcast. Because oh. it's a good one. Everybody listen. We had a list. Okay. And we didn't hear back. A lot of people we yeah. just didn't hear back from. You will hear. We will do this. Whenever there is an interesting story related to how we found a person, uh, we will tell the story at the end. But um, Vincent Virga is, you know, we discovered him. I think Steve Amadown rang my bell about him when we were doing the the trailblazer thing for the Ritas in 2019, which keeps coming up because it was a really important, you know, piece of my learning about the history of the genre, which I thought I kind of knew. And then suddenly, like, there were all these names that Steve really, Steve helped with that. And um, he kind of rang my bell about it. And we, so when we made our list, trailblazers, he was an obvious choice. He also, uh, Gaywick appears in Rebecca Romney's romance catalog. That happened after we started looking for him. What's interesting about the Rebecca Romney catalog and Faded Mates Trailblazers episodes is they really have, I think we and Rebecca are often like, oh, that's great. That person is on our list <laughs> or that our person is on her list. So it's really, it's a, it's a really cool um, marriage of the two projects. But I, I went looking for him and I found he has a, he has a website that hasn't been up, updated very recently. And I sent him an email that just introduced us because at this point, you know, I don't expect people know who we are. Sure. Um, so I introduced us and I sort of said, well, I'm in New York and I think you're in New York and I'm happy to come. I'm vaccinated. Like a lot of these emails are very like, if you can't do this, we're happy to come and be with you. We're vaccinated. And my phone rang and it was a weird number from New York. So I let it go to voicemail because obviously I let it go to voicemail. Who answers the phone? Nobody. And I had a voicemail from him. And I will say this, you guys, I have had a couple of really great voicemails over the course yes. of this project. Um, because what I've discovered is many people who are of a certain age are very happy to make a telephone call. So Vincent and I chatted a couple of times before we recorded. <laughs> the, f- the first time Sarah talked to him, she called me. and or You actually called me. I don't know what was yeah. catching. And you were like, we are a Vincent Verga uh, um, Stan podcast. Yeah, now. basically, we're like, just yes. going to have Vincent Verga on as our third forever. Like, you can just <laughs> join us all the time. Yeah. And here's the thing like, I had heard some of those stories already because we've had a couple of really great conversations, but this episode, Jen, yeah. like, I cried twice. So, for those of you listening in real time, usually we release on a Wednesday. And here it is. I, you know, it's an unusual day. We released a, a Beverly Jenkins a couple days ago, and here we are releasing another Trailblazer. And that's because this date is very special. This is actually the 41st anniversary of the release of Gaywick. And the reason we know that is because if we remember, Vincent mentioned that the night of the party that essentially was celebrating it, there was a massacre at the Ramrod Bar. And that happened on Wednesday, November 19th, 1980. And there I will put some of these articles in show notes. This is, um, for many people, maybe little remembered part of of gay history. But a former police officer entered a gay bar called the Ramrod and opened fire. And so, you know, this was a point in the interview where all of us, I think, but Vincent especially, got really teary because here it was this kind of height of kind of a career and a moment for him. And it was this really brutal reminder of um, how unaccepting 
some people would always be of of love stories and happily ever afters for gay and lesbian. And at that point, probably those were the only categories of Americans. So that's the reason we really wanted to release today's episode on the anniversary because... We wanted to say its name. The Trailblazer episodes are about speaking the names of the people who built the house. And yeah. in this particular case, it felt important to yeah. say the name of the Ramrod Massacre and to talk about this today. In show notes, we'll also put the names of the victims. Yes. Of the shootings. Um, and, you know, we're thinking of Vincent today. But we are so, so happy to have had him on the podcast. Um, I was, what a remarkable life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he is living. I think it's it's amazing how much he had to say about the work and about writing love stories for somebody who we have not heard heard from. You know, as a genre, we don't talk about Vincent as much as I think maybe we should. Yeah. I think one of the other things that is especially poignant is, right, like how people would like whisper to him. Mm. This is, this really stuck with me, right? Like I loved your book, but I, I can't really talk about it publicly. And one of the big, when we, when I think about like sort of, and uh, Rebecca's catalog has a lot of really interesting information about like sort of the evolution of like gay romance from, from gay wick. And I'm going to include a, a thread from a librarian I follow, Angie uh, Manfredi, who talked about how the assault on putting LGBTQ plus literature in libraries is more intense than ever. Mm -hmm. And how vital it is for children, young, for kids, for teenagers, I mean, for all kinds of people, but kids especially, to be able to see um, themselves in literature portrayed in a positive way and having like, ha you know, the potential for happiness and joy and, you know, and all kinds of stories. And she gives in this thread some really specific things that you can do as a regular person, as simple as calling up your local library and saying, I hope that you are keeping these materials on the shelves for kids and teenagers in our community. So I just want to say how urgent it is that, you know, we not take this for granted. I was very, it's, sometimes really overwhelming to feel like we've made no progress. But the way we make sure we keep the progress we have made is by fighting for it and not just assuming, right? Not just assuming that there'll always be gay and trans and lesbian romance or bisexuals in romance. And that especially if we want those materials to persist and be around for everyone, that we make it clear to our local libraries that um, and our school libraries, especially, that we support having those materials on the shelves. And on top of it, purchasing those materials, if you are have if you are able to, making sure that those materials um, pass through bookstores, mm -hmm. um, and at requesting those materials from your local bookstore, making sure that when you're in Barnes and Noble, you're asking for books, yeah, that represent you know all marginalized communities, but especially those in uh, LGBTQIA plus community. This is a, a, second, a second piece of the library struggle, but we all saw what happened um, on election day in Virginia. And we know that uh, the critical race theory piece was a huge piece um, that swung Virginia um, red, um, particularly uh, with white women. Um, and I want to just say that there's another great thread that, that went around last week that basically underscored that libraries are going to be the front line for so much of this. Um, yes. Anybody who is following that story in Virginia knows that it started with a mom, a white mom, who was horrified that her son had was forced to read Beloved in class and traumatized by the content in Beloved. So when we're talking about books being banned, we're talking about it happening right now, yeah. all over. So we'll yes. throw that into show notes, too. Yes. And that's it. These are, I think it's really also important to say, like, it seems so easy to think like it's happening somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's happening everywhere. Everywhere. It is happening at a school board in your town. Someone is going after 
someone who's going after books that they think are, you know. <laughs> and I just think, you know, romance, we, as romance readers, if we care about happily everyone after, we have to care about, we have to be like literally p- willing to stand up and say, because they're going to come, at, like, you know, romance will be first, right? Mm-hmm. But it, when I think for me, I'm like that, when I think about children, when I think about the kids in my room who need to see books about themselves on the shelves, this this is urgent work that we as listeners and we as as readers have to be a part of because it you know it it starts with it starts with censorship, right? It starts with banning books. It starts with saying we shouldn't be teaching these things because they make me uncomfortable. Yeah. And books are world changing in the sense that when you read a book, you know, when, when any kid reads these books, you know, it changes the way they look at the world and that's Mm -hmm. what we need. And that's why they want to get rid of them. I also just want to say, and this is, you know, we're down a little bit of a faded states rabbit hole now, but I just want to say, listen, school boards too. I mean, we saw that on Tuesday on the election day um, this year. The battle for this country is happening in school board races. Yes. So if you are out there and you are like, what could I do? Like, I I don't want to, I can't run for senator. Like, how could I help? Um, Check out runforsomething.org where you can learn more about running in your town to be on the school board. You know, right now, school boards are really frontlining this. Yes. And I would just say, like I said, if you can't do that, you can call your yes. principal of, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, that's the thing. Like, there are things you, you call the principal of your school and say, I support having having books that mm-hmm. talk about race and racism and, you know, have gay and lesbian characters in them. Like, there are lots of things that you can do. And I think it's just really important. Um, we're big believers in, you know, civic action. So it doesn't have to be running for Senate, but it can be calling your kid's principal and saying, don't you dare take these books out of these classrooms. I want my kid to be learning the truth about who we are as a country. I want my kid to be reading stories about people that are not like them. I want my kid to see the whole world out there in their classroom. In the meantime... We hope you enjoyed our interview with Vincent. We hope you head out and pick up Gaywick, um, which you can get in print or in E. And um, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. We felt, I mean, I I think I, I don't know if I've said this on the recordings yet, but it really does feel like every single conversation is so different from all the others. Absolutely. And this was really a delight. And I told Eric when we finished, I was like, we have to have him for dinner because he's amazing. (laughs) Honestly. I mean, and that's the thing, like, let alone from Gateway, like the story of his life doing images and the other work that he did. Like, this is someone who had a long and distinguished career in publishing. I want to hear all about Watergate. <laughs> Tell me so everything. Many things. I want to hear about Bill and Hillary. Mm-hmm. Everything. Going through, yeah, going through pictures that were like under the bed in Hillary Clinton's house. Sure. As that sounds does. like, first of all, if I had known that job existed, I would not be sitting here with you, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. My goodness. <laughs> anyway, that was a, remarkable. I'm so glad that we did that. And yeah, uh, I hope you all loved it. Tell us how you felt about it on Twitter at Fade Mates or on Instagram at Fatamates Pod. Um, you can also send Vincent an email the same way we did um, at his website, vincentvirga.com. I think Vincent would probably be really thrilled to hear from, from all of you if you felt moved by his, his stories. And otherwise, you can find us at fatamates.net. We will be back on Wednesday on proper schedule. Um, but today, we hope you're being kind to yourself and others. <laughs>